in the area of mental health, there is understandably much stress and abnormal behaviour. Well, what exactly is normal behaviour? Professor Jordan Smoller is the author of The Other Side of Normal, how biology is providing the clues to unlock the secrets of normal and abnormal behaviour. And Jordan is on the line. Good afternoon, Jordan. Good afternoon. Uh, d- d- does your brain uh, does your brain come with a design, so to speak, to say, well, this is normal behavior? Well, in a sense, we do. Uh, um, although the line between abnormal and normal, as I talk a lot about in the book, is one that's almost impossible to to say with with in a, as a factual matter. But basically, our minds were designed uh, around solving certain problems, and most of those were the problems that our evolutionary ancestors had to face, things like how to choose a mate or how to form relationships, how to understand what other people are thinking and feeling and how to avoid harm and so on. So there are some basic systems that we have in the brain for for these kinds of problems. But then there's a broad spectrum of normal when it comes to how that plays out, because each of us has differences in our genes and differences in our experiences that accumulate over our lifetimes and send us on slightly different trajectories. But there is a broad sweep of normal. Right. uh, 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 And that's a biologically determined normal rather than a societally determined normal. Well, that's a really interesting question because, you know, we talk about normal and abnormal all the time. And if you really stop and think about it, what, what do we exactly mean? Sometimes we mean things like unacceptable for abnormal or the average for normal. But those, I think, are not really all that helpful. Uh, normal is not a, a single point or, or the average or the ideal. It is, again, this kind of broad spectrum. Sometimes when we define things like psychiatric disorders, we are drawing a line, and we try to draw that line in the most responsible way that, that identifies conditions where people might be suffering and need help. But there is often a value judgment involved in making some of these distinctions, and that's where I argue in the book we need to really start with a bottom-up map of how the brain and the mind work if we're going to understand where things can go awry mm. and define disorder. Because I suppose if the evolutionary function of our brain uh, is essentially for us to survive, uh, as long as you're surviving, you're normal. Well, uh, in, in a sense, you know, you're normal. Uh, uh, I mean, again, the, the brain has these systems for uh, handling life's challenges. One of the things that we've learned, the more we understand how the mind works, is that there really aren't bright lines between normal and abnormal. And many of the things that we see as psychiatric disorders are really variations of the same systems we use to navigate the challenges of everyday life. So, for example, fear and anxiety, as you mentioned, is, you know, that's part of our human nature. We, we, our brains evolve to be able to detect danger and avoid harm. And we have circuits in the brain that are dedicated to this, and, and it's entirely normal to experience anxiety. Sometimes, though, that system goes into overdrive and goes awry in ways that cause real harm to people uh, and develop anxiety disorders like panic disorder or phobias or post-traumatic stress disorder. And so by understanding how the, the normal works, we can see where, um, where things can go awry. And that, I think, will help us demystify mental illness and destigmatize it. Uh, to a degree, could you say, maybe this is an oversimplification, but I mean, that, that, you know, we live in a 21st century digital age, but we're wandering around with these Stone Age brains in our skulls. I think that's that's true in part. I mean, uh, many of the things that our brains were uh, adapted to do or evolved uh, to focus on, you know, the world is a very different place from from the Pleistocene age. Um, And so, you know, some of the things that we uh, experience now weren't really issues back then. And they in in some ways are, are tweaking our brains in ways that we wouldn't have expected as we were evolving, like street drugs. I mean, which sort of tap into our brain's reward system and sometimes don't let go and people get addictions, which obviously was not a problem uh, millions of years ago or thousands of years ago. Um, And, you know, also when it comes to to things that we find attractive or, um, uh, you know, beauty or sexual attraction, sometimes the things that uh, we see in the media are pushing buttons that I think our brains um, evolved to have, but they go to such extremes that, uh, you know, they can somehow sometimes have um, negative consequences for us. In what sense, negative consequences? Well, you know, over the uh, last 40 years or so, if you look at the 
media images of beauty and uh, sexual attraction, they've become more extreme in many ways. You know, in, in magazines and so on, women are, are getting uh, thinner and, uh, you know, uh, proportions that are, are very hard to achieve in, in, in reality. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, there was a study done of male action figures. You know, these are toys that hmm. kids work with. And in the last few years, they have exploded into heaps of muscularity, which are really not humanly possible. And in some ways, these things are sort of pushing our buttons, uh, you know, taking certain things that we are biased to find attractive and taking them to an extreme that, uh, and the harm part of that, I guess, is that, um, you know, sometimes people feel like they need to attain those those kinds of images, which in fact are, are almost impossible to do. Uh, and does that mean, though, that I mean, societal forces then are kind of basically overwhelming any biological wiring we, we might have, say, in terms of what we find attractive? Well, I think they're, they're both at play. So um, uh, as I talk about in the book, there's really good reason to think that our brains uh, have a little bit of a built-in bias to find certain things attractive. For example, in faces, there are certain features that around the world people seem to find attractive. One of them is symmetry. Another is averageness, which means uh, kind of the, the being at the statistical average of features in, in, a, in a population. And there, the reason that may be attractive overall is that it signals health and uh, uh, resistance to disease and so on. Hmm. But, you know, those are just sort of subtle biases. Uh, but then culture can come in and kind of um, push that around quite a bit. And make people uh, make people's actual preferences uh, diverge uh, in in you know extreme ways in some cases. Yeah, it, it, because it, it, is it tricky? I mean, it's it's back to our nurture nature uh, um, uh, argument, I suppose. But, but but given that the brain is is, is such a, a plastic organ and it's changing all the time, is it slightly nonsensical to say your brain is wired a certain way because it's continually rewiring itself? That's a really good point, and and I think you're right. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've learned is that um, this this age old question of how much is nature and how much is nurture. The answer to that question is uh, yes. <laughs> you know, it's it's clearly both. So clearly, we have a genetic blueprint that kind of sets the stage for certain things. But we now know that, especially early in life, the brain is kind of using the world to wire itself. It's placing bets about what the world is going to be like if you're an infant, for example. And certain experiences can have really powerful effects on how things turn out for us. But even after that, um, the brain does get remodeled based on experience and on what the world is like. There's the famous example in the UK of London cabbies who have to learn the knowledge mm. and memorize 25,000 streets in London, if you look at the brains of those individuals, as has been done, you see expansions in parts of the brain that are responsible for mapping the spatial environment. So we are sensitive to, to the world for a long time, but we do know that some of those effects are stronger when we're young and our brains are developing. Jordan, thank you very much for speaking with us today. It was Professor Jordan Smaller. Jordan is the author of The Other Side of Normal, How Biology is Providing the Clues to Unlock the Secrets of Normal and Abnormal Behavior. We're going to take a break. After that, the woman who was murdered by starvation.